Hallelujah. We're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 through 27 this morning. We get, we're waiting on some te technical difficulties. You up now? We're going. We're live. Amen. Need to get live towards that last song from now on. Give them a little bit of a little taste of the last song. So 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 through 27, Old Testament. Amen. All right, let's go. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king... Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why, why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went through all, out all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand, thousand, and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred, three score, and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin, he didn't count them. For the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, I'm begging you, God, do away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spoke unto David, I'm sorry, the Lord spoke unto Gad, David's seer, or another word for prophet, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you Three things, and you need to choose one of them, that I may do it unto you. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Choose thee either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before your foes, while that the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence, which means sickness, in the land. And the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to preach your word, O oh Lord God. And we ask you, Lord God, for the opportunity, Lord God, to speak forth your truth, Lord. We just want to give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord God, for your anointing, Lord God, that sets the captive free. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one that unlocks, Lord our understanding, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one that allows, Lord God, the eyes of our inner man to be open so that we might see. And we need your help, Holy Spirit, because you, Lord, the preacher can try to preach, the preacher can try to teach, but if the Holy One of Israel is not anointing the Word of God, if he's not anointing the communication, Lord, then we still remain blind. Lord God, and blindness is not a place for your people to be. Lord, your blindness and deafness is not a place for your people to be. Lord, help your people see. Help your people hear. Help the lame feet of your people be straightened out and to be able to walk, Lord God, according to your will. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Listen, there's two different versions of this passage. I want you to see. So in the one we just read in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1, if you'll put that scripture back up on the screen, I want to remind you what it said. It says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. But look at 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 1. Same story, same occurrence. Some people would say there's conflict in the Bible. Some people would say that the Bible goes against itself. No, no, sir, no, ma'am. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. 
It's two different angles. The Lord wants you to know that in every situation, every trial in your life that you face, there's, there's going to be two sides to the story. There's two different angles from which it's coming. Look at this. First Chronicles, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 24 and 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. So who is it? Is it God that's moving on David's heart? Is it Satan that's provoking David's heart? There are two separate angles of the same incident. Satan causing David, God causing David, and an important perspective for every Christian is to understand this. That in every trial we face, we should be reminded that both Satan and God have an intended result to gain out of the occurrence. You with me this morning? Amen. Satan wants to convince God's people to transgress God's will, which opens a floodgate of chaos and turmoil. Amen. His intent, simply stated, destruction. He will stop at nothing less than destruction. He will not allow you to peacefully walk upon this earth and to say that you're going to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No, his, his word is opposer. He is the one that stands in the face of God. He is the one that has to present himself before the throne of God and to say to God, he sits there and he constantly accuses the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. One day he will be cast out and he will no longer be allowed in there. He doesn't live there. No. Periodically, he has to come and give an account for his work. I'm about to show you that in a second. He has to give an account for his work, but there's going to be a day when he will no longer be allowed Hallelujah. to go into heaven anymore. And the accuser of our brethren will come down, but woe unto the inhabitants of the earth on that day, for great will be his wrath. You just think it's bad now. Brothers and sisters, you don't want to be left behind when God calls his church home. You don't want to be left to navigate this earth. Amen. In that time frame. So Lord, help us. We look forward to your return, but we know that there's work to be done until that day. You know, God gave man a free will to choose spirit or flesh. I think it's very important that we be reminded of that. He gave us a free will to choose spirit or flesh. And God's desire is that man will use this free will that he's been given to choose God's way. Yes. And when that man or woman chooses that path, well, it's kind of like I was sitting in my bed thinking, what is it like, Lord? Now, I don't personally have one of these things, but I know that Chris is now certified to do it. And that's one of the things that I would like to do is to get one of those generators that's hooked up into your house. That when the electricity goes off, right, you get, a, you get a transformer that blows down the road and all of a sudden your electricity goes up. And guess what? My neighbor next door, as soon as that electricity goes up, the generator kicks on. That's the illustration of what I'm trying to tell you. Is that God gave man a free will to make a choice. And he's either going to make a choice to go according to his flesh, according to the will of man, according to the will of his own heart and in his mind. Or he's going to choose to take that free will that's been given to him. And he's going to go down the pathway that God has mapped out for his children. And then just as soon as that, that child of God is ready to do that, to truly surrender to the ways and the will of God. It's just like when the electricity goes on. Off and old Murray's elect, uh, electrical generator, boom, boom, or a gas generator, whatever it is, kicks on immediately. God's grace wants to start flowing in that situation. He wants to start helping us. He wants to be there with us to hold our hand through it. I'm not telling you that immediately the situation changed. No, child of God, it doesn't work that way. Many times there's repercussions. Many times there's circumstances that we must navigate and walk through. But God's grace is there and it's kicked on and he's giving us energy and his spirit is empowering us and able to walk with the Lord, amen, and to be strengthened and encouraged. So I want you to be strengthened and encouraged this morning that no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, amen, there is a way that God's grace will be there to get you through. You know, unfortunately, there's a great likelihood that even people that love God will make fleshly choices. Hello. I don't know about you, but I've made plenty of fleshly choices. I still make them today. Help me, Lord. We make fleshly choices that result in chaos, yes. wow. resulting in frustration, yes. resulting in heartache and pain. God doesn't want it, but he allows it. He allows it for the greater good, that it will ultimately produce life. In addition, God will give Satan a certain amount of latitude. Listen to me. This doesn't work well for those word of faith folk. 
that are out there they all they're wanting to do is confess all the promises of God and they just never they, they'll tell you if they see turmoil in your life that you're out of the will of God hold on a second there's a real opposer upon this earth and then he is not com yes he is completely defeated because when Jesus de defeated him at Calvary when Jesus said it is finished that means Jesus paid every price of every sin amen and you and I now if we'll keep our faith in the right object which is Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross and now we We've been given righteousness. Now the power of God can flow in us, flow through us. And again, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. The, the God that we serve has given, gained victory over the evil one on our behalf. The problem is that we don't want to let God fight the fight. We're over here trying to fight many times our own self. You can't fight this one. But now you used to say, hit him, hit him first, boy. Pop, pop them in the chin. Go ahead. Just When it gets started, just go ahead and give them what they want. But it ain't going to work like that, Daddy. You, you, can't, you can't pop this one in the chin. It don't work that way. No, it's the opposite of what you would have thought that it needed to work. Right. You got to learn how to humble yourself. You got The more you try to control it, the harder you try to grab a hold Come to on. it and fix it, the worse you make it. Yeah. What you got to learn to do is just humble yourself. Surrender yourself under the mighty hand of God. God resists the proud. Yeah. It's like two opposing sides of a magnet. It's repelling. God's repelled against pride. Why? Because that was the original sin of Satan. He said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. Well, you know what Jesus said? I saw Satan fall to earth like lightning. God's not allowing rebellion in heaven. You think he's going to sit here and monkey around with our rebellion? No, he's not going to monkey around with our rebellion. He hates rebellion. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. He hates pride because it looks like Satan. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he might exalt you. Amen. In humility, I believe there's a, prom a promotion. In humility, I believe there's a raise. But listen to me. It's not just about promotions and raises. It's about being exalted spiritually. It's about being lifted up by the hand of God and strengthened Amen. by the power of God. Amen. God doesn't want it, but he allows it for the greater good that it will produce life in us. And in addition, God will give Satan a certain amount of latitude to create the temptation that produces a test. That's where I went off on my rabbit trail. I said that the word of faith folk don't want to hear that kind of thing. If you're not driving a Rolls and wearing a $500 suit, if you happen to find yourself in the midst of bad circumstances, you just don't have enough faith. You're just not confessing the right thing. That's a life from the pit of hell. And if that's the preacher you've been listening to, you need to turn him off. Because all the greatest men of God, all the greatest women of God had to go through trials on this earth. Amen. Because faith. This is the part of my message this morning, by the way. Faith will be tested. Amen. Faith will be tested. You're going to go through a trial. You're going to go through the test. It's going to be proven that you truly are who you say you are. Because let me tell you something, child of God. Jesus walked upon this earth and he said, I am the son of God. And you know what the evil one did? He said, okay, well, if you're the son of God, let's see how you handle this. Jesus passed the test. And he passed the test for you and I to give us strength so that we can pass the test. That doesn't mean we're never going to fail a test. It means we're going to get back up. A righteous man gets up seven times. And we're going to keep on going. And we're going to keep on holding on, amen, to the Lord. He doesn't, God doesn't want it, but he allows it. He gives Satan a little bit of a latitude to produce a test. But listen to this. Like a dog on a leash, he can only go so far. You need to know that. Let me repeat that again. God will allow Satan a certain amount of latitude in your life to produce a test, but like a dog on a leash, he can only go so far. You know, the other day, uh, my other daughter, Bella, I was talking to her boyfriend, Justin, and you know, that boy had some wisdom flowing out of his mouth, but he was all excited about the Lord. He was facing some stuff, and he said, you know what? I got to be reminded of something, that when I'm in the midst of my trial, that, that, that God's not, arm is not short. God is the one that is sovereign. God is the one that is more powerful. He is control and he can give me victory no matter how bad the situation that's right, is. That's right. But you know what? Sometimes we're on a mountain and the next thing you know we're in a valley. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And even in David's life. I mean don't forget this morning because I'm going to give you a lot of different scripture. We're talking about David this morning. A warrior. A warrior king. Yeah. All kind of victories under him tucked away in his belt. Trophies. I'm talking about big trophies. The head of Goliath. Amen. Amen. What a what a what a story of infamy. Teenage boy took down the giant. Warrior king, but at the same time, 
finding himself in fear, finding himself in moments of frustration. And you got to know something, child of God. There's been going to be times in your life where you're going to feel like you're on the mountaintop. And then there's going to be times in your life you're going to know you're in the valley. And the enemy's going to try to attack you when you're in the valley. Whenever your mind is depressed, whenever you're concerned and you don't know how you're going to get out, the enemy's going to pounce on that. You think he's going to back off a little bit? No, he's not. But let me tell you something. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And the God that you serve can, is, not can, he will get you through if you will hold on to him. He's like a dog on a leash. You can only go so far. We see that in the story of the book of Job. Look at Job chapter 1. Verse 6 through 12. Because you see, there's the same angle in this story. The same angle that God has a plan and the devil has a plan. The devil's plan is to accuse you before your God. The devil's plan is to trip you up and shake you up and mess you up. God's plan is that you make it through trusting him and that you come out on the other side victorious. Why? Because whenever that happens, he gets glory. Amen. Amen? Amen? Look at this. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, now I just got to tell you, I've done a lot of study, and you just got to take my word for this. That's talking about fallen angels right there. That's, what it, that's, the, ter that's the interpretation. It's in more than one place in the Old Testament. It's also in the book of Genesis, chapter 6. It's talking about the sons of God, which are the fallen angels that fell with Satan. According to the book of Revelation, <coughs> two-thirds of the angels fell with Satan in his fall. There was a day when the, son, the fallen angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, where do you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth. And he's wandering around. That's what it says, right? First Peter says that, that your enemy, the, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's always on the prowl, child of God. He's always looking to destroy. Yes. He said, I'm going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Now, I got to tell you something that whenever he's doing, saying this, he said, I'm walking to and fro. I'm, I'm walk, I got to add a little bit of here because it's not in the text. And I believe that this is what happened. This is my opinion. I'm walking to and fro. I'm walking up and down. And oh, by the way, you see your servant, Matt, that you're over here talking up so big. Yeah, well, guess what I saw him do last week. Well, you see your servant over here that you're talking up so big that you say that he's here to bring you glory. Well, you should have seen what we were doing last night. Mm -hmm. So all your little servants that you say are so good to you and love you so much. Oh, no, they fail in you. I know it. You know it. <laughs> we both know it. I'm the accuser and I'm here to remind you, God, that they doing just like what I did. And they ain't no better than me. And this is what the Lord would say. <laughs> The Lord said unto Satan, but have you considered my servant Job? I don't know if you feel it, but I feel the Lord on that. See, Job was a man that walked upright before the Lord. The word of God says that he was perfect in all his ways. It's not saying that he was without sin. There was only one man that ever walked without sin. His name was Jesus. But yet Job had a place in his heart where the Lord was sanctified. What does that mean? To be separated out. God had a special, uh, Job had a special place in his heart for the Lord and he protected it. The, the word of God says that Job was concerned because his children were having a feast down the road on his property. And he thought in his mind and in his heart, my children may do something against the Lord today as they're having that feast. So let me lay out some sacrifice to the Lord. Let me intercede. That's how much Job loved God. I don't want them even sitting on my property. I just want to, I want to have a right relationship with God. And he's over here walking with the Lord and he's not doing nothing wrong at this time. But Satan comes up there and this is what he says. God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. He's a perfect or a mature and an upright man. He's one that fears God. He hates evil. And then Satan answered the Lord. This is what he said. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance has increased in the land. But put forth thy hand right now and touch all that he has. He will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went <coughs> forth from the presence of the Lord. Two things right there. Satan's plan is to destroy 
God's servant, but look at this. God allows Satan only a certain amount of space to create a test. You can touch all that he has right now, but you cannot touch his body. Later, Satan's not happy with that. Okay, well, I touched his stuff. I ruined his stuff. I, I killed, you let me kill even his children. And some bad stuff happened to him. Okay, he hadn't cursed you that, but, but, if, but if you let me touch him, then now he's going to curse you. God said, okay, you can touch him, but you're not going to be able to kill him. What I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that God is sovereign. I don't understand exactly why. Well, I do understand why he allows the things that he allows us because there's things in us that need to come out. There's things in us that need to be revealed. And we're over here walking on this earth acting like we got it all together, acting like we're doing it right and everybody else is doing it wrong. And the reality of it is God wants to show us. See, in the end of the trial, let me tell you what Job says. Not only does God want to show us ourselves, he wants to show us himself. Oh, that's good right there. Not only does God want to show you intricacies of about your own heart. He wants to show you intricacies about his heart. And the way that you're going to get close to him is you're going to have to go through the trial. You're going to have to go through a valley experience. In the end, whenever Job says this, he said, he tries me. I'm going to come forth as gold. And he said this. He said, I used to know him by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen him. See, when it was all said and done, Job, you just thought Job was walking with the Lord. You just thought Job knew the Lord. But whenever the Lord brought him through on the other side, he knew God in a way that he never could have imagined that he knew him. And in Job 42, verses 11 and 12, it says this. And then there came unto him all his brethren, talking about Job, and all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him, and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Isn't that, oh, hold on a second, let me not get too fast here. Every man also gave him a piece of money and everyone an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. It says, look, look, this is what I put. Most times, that's what people do. They blame God for the bad. That's what they said. All the evil that the Lord put upon him. God was a part of this situation, but don't be blaming God whenever you find bad stuff happening in your life. Most of the time, we find ourselves in the midst of miserable situations. I'm just preaching from experience now. It's because either number one, we made some bad choices that opened up a floodgate of chaos. Or number two, we got stuff on the inside of us that God is wanting to reveal to us. God's purposes are good. It's not God's fault that Adam and Eve chose sin. You don't have to believe in creation if you don't want to. I'm sticking to the word of God. I see where it's brought me. It's not God's fault that Adam and Eve made the choice to eat from the one tree that they weren't supposed to eat from, which completely caused a cataclysmic change. What are you talking about? The whole earth has fallen. Earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, chaos, disaster. All of mankind has fallen. And bad things happen to good people. People were murdered. Some of the most sweetest, innocent people you ever know driving down the road, some drunk driver. Bam! Hits them, kills them. Why, where is God's justice in that? Listen to me. It's not God's fault that sin is, is rampant upon the earth. No. Man made a choice. And in Adam, all have sin. Oh, that's not fair. I didn't, I didn't do what Adam did. No, you're right. The book of Romans says you didn't. In Romans chapter 5, it says that you did not sin in the similitude of Adam. What does that mean? Adam was without sin, yet he was one of the first to sin. And that wasn't you because you were born of Adam in sin. In other words, when you were born of your mama, you already had sin in you. But guess what? You know, my daddy used to play poker and my mama's people played boo-ray and all that. I didn't know what it was. I was just a little kid around the table. They over there cussing and fussing and drinking and playing cards. And they said, Andy, oh boy, you, you didn't make, put your Andy into the pot. <laughs> What I'm trying to tell you is, is that everybody throws their ante in the pot when it comes to sin. You can blame it on Adam all you want, but we've all thrown our ante into the pot. We got into the game. At some point in time, we've all done wrong. We've all transgressed God, and we all need the help of God. Yes, Amen? Lord. But we always want to blame God. God is ultimately the one in charge. I want you to see that also. God's intended goal, again, in the end, is to bless his people. Amen? Now, I want you to know something. This is the main thing that I'm seeing with this whole story of David. The main purpose of all this is to understand that faith must be tested. It will never be sufficient to God for us to just say that we are Christians. I don't think I can scream that loud enough. 85% of Americans every year on the Gallup poll say they are Christians. 
You can't say that just say you're a Christian because your mommy and daddy were Christians. You can't just say that you're a Christian because the pilgrims came over to America and one time America was a Christian nation, so say, and that now because of that, not the pilgrims, yeah, the pilgrims, uh, and, and so now, uh, so say, we're all Christians because this was, no, that's not the way it works. Instead, faith must be tested. Faith must be put on trial. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. You don't win a championship without actually playing the game. Mm. You see that? Everybody's wanting to crown the Saints. Oh, the Saints are going to do it this year, man. In, in advance, Vegas said Saints Super Bowl champions. No, that's why they play the game. You, you can't just walk up there and say, I'm the champion. you got to actually get it done. Right, right. And when it comes to faith, it's not going to be just about talking. It's going to be about trusting. Amen? You don't practice medicine without getting a degree, and you definitely will never walk on streets of gold and live in eternity with God without having your faith greatly tested upon this earth. Amen. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. We're talking about faith being tested. It says right here, wherein you greatly rejoice. Talking about the church. You're going to rejoice. Though now for a season. You know what that means? It's temporary. Whatever you're in right now, wherever you are right now, it doesn't have to remain that way. It can be temporary. Though even right now you are in a, a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. What, what does heaviness mean in the Greek? To be affected with sadness, causing grief. To throw something to someone into sorrow. Have you ever felt like that before? Have you ever felt depressed and in the midst of heaviness? Yes. He says, uh, how? So, so look at this. How was it that I was thrown in? I'm asking a question in this next verse. How was it that I was thrown into this sadness or this heaviness? How? Through manifold temptations or through all kinds of trials. Through all kinds of situations. That's how you were thrown into this season of heaviness. Sometimes it hits you all at once. It's one thing after the other. It's ten things at one time. It's like, Lord, I couldn't handle one. How am I going to handle ten? You're going to trust in me. You're going to keep your eyes on me, son. And I'm going to get you through. So that's how. But why? Why would you allow this to happen? Because that's in verse 7. That the trial of your faith. Being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, I want you to know something. Gold is very precious in the earth. In the earthly realm, it has purchase power. But in the economy of God, faith moves the hand of God. And in this situation, we need to understand that we're not talking about faith that God will do something for you. Listen, sometimes I get kind of technical. Sometimes I get kind of deep. But we need that. Amen. We need to understand the intricacies of God's word. People can talk about me all they want to. Oh, he gets too deep. Okay, maybe, maybe this flavor isn't for you. Amen. <laughs> I watched this, sales, this saleswoman one time. And I, I don't recommend you. I'm not going to tell you her name because you try to watch her. And she got a little bit of a potty mouth. But she said something one time. She's, she made multi-millionaire selling roofs. And this is what she said. I watched a little video of her. You know what she said? Be you. Be you. Ain't everybody going to like your flavor, man. And if you try to make everybody like your flavor, just be yourself. I mean, yeah, if, we're talking about, if we're not going to talk about sales, be professional. Handle yourself like you're trying to get something done. But at the same time, be yourself. Don't get all stiff and try to be somebody else. No, just be comfortable and let yourself flow. I got to be who I am. And part of who I am is to get dig deep. Yeah. Part of who I am is to look at the intricacies. And I need you to understand something. When we're talking about faith right here, which is the coin, if you will, the purchase power of God's economy, we're not talking about believing God that he's going to do something for us. He's already done it. Amen. He's already done it. We're talking about believing God. We're talking about being in the faith. We're talking about the noun version of the word. See, there's an action faith. I'm, I'm currently believing God that he's going to do this thing in my life. Action faith, right? That believes that God's going to do an action for me. That's real faith. That's an important type of faith. I'm talking about the faith. See, listen, I'm going to draw it on the board for you right here. You ready? Yeah. God saved you out of the world. And I know that many people have seen this already, but we live in a big old world. 
Probably take me a long time to draw enough people, right? Six billion, y'all got time? <laughs> Six billion people, okay? You get the point, right? Six billion people, a lot of people. Let's go ahead and just make a circle of them. You get the point, right? And then there's one Jesus. God had a big old plan, folks. And I know that I talk to y'all about it all the time, but it's important that we understand that this didn't just happen yesterday. Right, right. God didn't do this down some back dark alley and nobody knew about it. No, everybody ought to know about it by now. And if they don't know about it, it's because they don't want to know about it. Because they've chosen not to believe God at his word. But according to his word, he called a man named Abraham out when there was no nation called Israel. And he said, come out of your father's house and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless those that bless you. Curse those who curse you. And listen, and through your seed, I'm talking about your offspring, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had the twelve tribes, and his fourth son was Judah, and from Judah came King David, and a thousand years later, from the tribe of Judah came Jesus, who was the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one of God, and the Apostle Paul said this, and he said that through your seed, not many seeds, not just the nation of Israel, but through your seed, which is one, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. That one seed is Christ. Amen. Yes. And so listen, we're talking about the faith, the faith. Amen. Yes. A world filled with people that believe in all kinds of stuff. I could write all this up here if you wanted me to. Buddha. I don't care how sweet Buddha was. He ain't died for your sin. Oh, yeah. Allah. I don't care what you believe. Even if they come try to say that. No, no. Allah is, is really sweet. And, 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 and it's just like a wrong French. No, no, no. Allah is not sweet. Allah was an ancient moon god that came from the Arabian desert. He was not who they say he was. He was not the god of Abraham. Just because Ishmael is a product of Abraham also. Ishmael was not the chosen one. Isaac was the chosen seed. Abraham, just like David in this story, just like you and I, you operated in the flesh and produced something that still causes chaos in the earth today. Yes. We're surprised whenever chaos is causing our life when we walk in the flesh. That's the problem. That's right. Lord, help us. Yes. No, he's not the one. And I can list all kinds of false gods. But there's a world, is what I'm trying to say, that is out there that is against the things of God. And yet God sent Jesus. And we're talking about the Faith, And when you hear the gospel, wherever you are, whoever you are, and you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit stimulated your heart. Where were you? Can you bring your mind back to that day? No. Whenever you first remembered. Oh, I remember, man. I was an old long-haired, 17-year-old. Walked up in my sister's house with all torn up clothes, jacked up. The world had beaten me up. And I went to that church service. I know I've told y'all the story, but I'll never be ashamed. I'll never want to forget what God has done for me. Oh, and that woman preacher, boy, don't tell me women aren't called to preach the gospel. That woman preacher stood up there and she started talking about the blood and the enemy was trying to like frustrate me. Why does she keep saying blood? I don't like that word. It's making me feel bad. It's making me feel weird. I don't like it because the devil knew something was shaking in the spiritual realm. Right. Oh, thank God for that preacher. Amen. And she kept and she could hear the Holy Ghost. Boy, look, let me tell you, I've been praying. Lord, let me hear because some people just hear better. I need to hear better. She stopped that service right there. She said, the Holy Spirit is dealing with somebody in this place. You better get up and give your life to Jesus because now is the day of, the, of salvation. Today is the day to make your decision. I couldn't help myself. My heart started beating out of my chest. I ran to the front. Don't care what they think. And I used to care what people think. But look at me, man. I, my clothes are all torn up. I'm all jacked up. I ran to the front. I fell on my knees. Jesus. And listen to me. When I did that, guess what happened? Boom, right there. Heard the gospel. Born again. You've been brought into a new place, man. You're in Christ. You're in Amen. the faith. Amen. But it's not good enough just to say I'm in the faith. That's right. Yeah, the first thing I did was I wrote my sister a letter. I said, fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven. She said, you in trouble then, brother. Because you're the worst. <laughs> It's not good enough just to write a letter and say, oh, I'm saved now, and you better just line up. According. No, no, you thought that that was, that was just the beginning, boy. Yeah. Your faith's going to be tested. Yeah. It's been tested every day since then, and guess what? It's been had some bad times, some good times. It's going to continue to be tested. But in the end, I'm telling you, sometimes this is all I pray. I, all I could pray and whisper to God was, Lord, all I ask is that in the end, with your help, 
I would hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. That's what I want from God. Amen. And if he doesn't show up in my life each and every day, it ain't going to happen, ch child of God. Amen. I hate to tell you, but your pastor ain't all whatever you might be thinking. He needs some help from Jesus. I need some help down here. And if he'll give me the help, I'm telling you right now, I could be a warrior. I don't know if I can take down Goliath, but I could be a warrior in the spirit if God will help me to do that. But without his help, I will be lost. I'll be like a rudderless ship upon a raging sea. I'll be lost like a man without a compass. I won't know where to go. I'll make my own decisions. I'll step out in the flesh. I'll open up a floodgate of chaos in my life. Turn well, and the enemy will try to use it to destroy me. Amen. But I'm in the faith, and faith must be tested because, like gold is precious on earth to purchase, have purchase power. Faith in the economy of God is to purchase power with God. Amen? Amen. The world versus the faith is what's going on here, and there's a trial that must take place. The word trial there is the proving that by which something is tried or proven, you got to go through the test. Our faith in God is what connects us to him. True faith isn't a head thing. It's a heart thing. True faith is the spiritual man in us saying, yes, God, I choose you and I want to live for you and I give my life to you. True faith isn't just, yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Instead, true faith will result in an intimate relationship with God. And listen to me, in that relationship, there will be a journey between the believer and God. And on that journey, God will reveal to the believer the contents of his heart. Amen. I need to slow down a little bit and repeat that for you. There's going to be a journey. If you're a true believer and you are truly saved out of the world and into Christ. Somebody might be tuning in right now on accident. I don't know. But let me tell you something. They might say, well, that, I don't like that. Yeah. So you're telling me that I can't do what I want to do. You're telling me I can't listen to what I want to listen to. I can't go where I want to go. I can't date who I want to date. Oh, I don't like that. Well, guess what, baby? You don't like the word of God. Right. And you don't like God. You, and listen, you tune out now. But in a year from now, if you still tune back in. Because you might be able to hear something. You might not be ready for it yet. I realize that not everybody's ready for this church. Not everybody's ready for this teaching. Because you know why? By the grace of God. Now, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. Because it's only God's grace that I even know some truth. Amen. But it's because not everybody's ready for the truth. That's right. I'm not, I hate to use a worldly illustration like this. But it was a good movie. It had, probably had some cussing in it, though. I watched it a long time ago. A Few Good Men. We want the truth. You guys said Jack Nicholson for the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, a lot of times that's just that's the facts. Yeah. We can't handle the truth mm -hmm. because it pokes us in the eye. Yeah. It kind of punches us in the side a little bit. It hurts because we realize that we're not always walking in the truth and that we're contrary to God's yeah. truth. And I don't want nobody telling me what I can do and what I can't do. Yeah. And we fight against it and we fight against God. And the whole time we don't even realize that we would just surrender to him and his truth. It's like all of a sudden we feel the weight and the burden and the guilt be lifted. And we're like, my God, what was I doing trying to contend with the most high? Why would the clay try to speak to the potter in the way that I've been doing, in the way that I've been living? Why wouldn't I just soften myself and let him mold me upon the will of life as I go on this journey? And he's taking me with him. Listen to me. There's going to be a journey in the relationship between the believer and God. And in that journey, I'm here to tell you something. He's going to reveal to us the contents of our heart because that's what he does. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your father. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led thee. Remember that. God's leading you down a path. These 40 years in the wilderness, what did he do this for? To humble you. To prove you. That's another way of saying to put you through the test. To put your faith through the trial. Why? So that you would know what was in your heart. Mm. See, if you don't go through the trial, you're not going to really know what's in your heart. Sometimes when you go through the trial and your heart's revealed to you, guess what? It's kind of ugly. Yep. But the Lord knows it's there and he wants you to see it's there. It, it's okay to see the ugly, but we got to deal with it the right way. we got to say, Lord, I see the ugly. Please take it. Yeah, yeah. Please take my ugly, Lord. I want to give it to you and replace it with your pretty. Take my ugly. Give me your pretty. Amen. 
Isn't that good? God, Jesus is pretty, man. I don't mean that in a physical sense. I'm talking about he's kind, he's soft, he's gentle, he's loving, he's merciful, he's long-suffering. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians. They're the fruit of the Spirit, man. All of those ways that we react to the people in our lives when we get frustrated, Jesus don't act like that. Amen. That's the ugly I'm talking about. We need Jesus to, pre- to replace it with his pretty. Because listen to me, when we start acting like Jesus and we're soft and we're kind and we're gentle, <laughs> it gets a whole different response. I'm not sitting here to tell you to be weak. No, I'm telling you to be meek. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? Well, a meek is like a, is a stallion that's been trained. <laughs> yeah, a stallion's no good if he's wild. Yeah. You know, over there bucking and kicking and snorting and all this kind of, oh, look how pretty he is, man. Look at him, boy, as he prances in his little thing, his little muscles missing him in the sun. And ain't nobody can ride him. Can't do nothing with him. Can't plow with him. Can't ride with him. Can't get nothing done. But let, let him be broken. Then now you got some. Lord, break us. Amen. Be meek. All kind of power. Jesus was meek. You know, Jesus, meekness, you know what it means? It means to have great power, yet it be restrained and it be used for its proper purpose. Whenever, whenever they showed up and they, whom do you seek, Jesus asked. We seek Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Bam. Boom. They all fall to the ground. He even told him, he said, do you think I can't call a legion of angels down here? A legion of my father. That's a whole lot of angels, buddy. Let me tell you something. You talk about a wipeout disaster real quick. Jesus didn't do it because it wasn't God's will. You, you think that if you had that kind of power in you, you wouldn't want, I'm about to show you what it's all about right here. Sick of more. You're about to see this disaster. And so many times, like, you know, that's what meekness is to know that you got, you, sometimes you can do stuff. Sometimes you have authority in people's lives. Sometimes you can do stuff and, 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 and get things accomplished and, and make things happen. But guess what? Is it God's will? And will you be able, by His grace, to restrain yourself from doing the wrong thing? Why? Because in God's eyes, it's the right thing. Amen? Amen? That's just extra right there. (laughs) The Lord led thee, starting by verse 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord your God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So whenever you find yourself in the midst of the trial of the wilderness, will you keep his commandments? Will you keep his word is really what we're talking about. He humbled you and he caused you to be hungry, but he also fed you with manna, which you knew not. In other words, you didn't know where that stuff was coming from. It floated out of heaven. Neither did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. He says your raiment or your clothing wax not old upon you. In other words, your clothes didn't get wore out. Neither did your foot swell from all that walking every day walking for 40 years. You shall also consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. What does it mean to be chastened? It means to be disciplined. It means to be disciplined with instruction, with the intent that something's going to change. Whenever there's something going wrong in a child's life, a good parent is going to take the time to say, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. And Lord help you if you're a parent like me and you got one like Bella. I don't think Bella's chiming in. I think, yeah. Hey, you got a daughter like Bella. Yeah, but look at you. She don't say it exactly like that. It happened the other day. Though. I woke up and I did something. I don't remember what it was. I was poking with her. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And she said something, and it was kind of disrespectful. I felt like it was. You know, she lashed out at me. I mean, she's 23 now or something like that, 22. I don't know. She lashed out at me. And I said, Bella, that was kind of disrespectful. The Word of God says you're supposed to honor your mother and your father. She said, yep. And it says you're not supposed to provoke your children to anger, bro. She was like, I need to receive instruction. She's right I don't know what kind of preacher she'd make, but y'all think I'm going to this is to light you up, boy. Lord, help her. Anyway, the Lord chastens us. Right? He brings correction. <laughs> On that day, he brought correction through Bella's mouth. He wants to change us. He wants to help us. It's not okay, though. For Listen to me. The preacher did not just make it okay for a child to backtalk their mom and daddy. All right? Because sometimes parents just are know what's right and what's wrong, and the child doesn't know what's right or wrong. Amen? And they go their own way. 
So, and that's not okay. And the parent's supposed to be trying to protect. So guess what? If a parent is actually giving forth the word of God, whether or not we think that their life is perfect or not is not the issue because ain't nobody's life in this place perfect. Amen. But if they're representing God and they're representing the word of God and they're giving godly counsel, praise God, then the child is supposed to receive the godly counsel. Amen. And at the same time, that child is supposed to receive godly counsel, I'm talking about the parent, from God so that their life can line up. Because once our life lines up, our words have a whole lot more oomph behind them, if I can say it that way. Verse 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God. In other words, you shall know his word and walk in it. That's what you could say right there. To walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God brings you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of, of olive oil and honey, a land where you shall eat bread without scarceness, you shall not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. That's a good land. Listen to me. There is a spiritual connection for the New Testament Christian right here. There's another quick little joke. I hate to admit it, but when I was 15, I stole my dad's car, ran away to California. And all ever since then, he would say, yeah, he was looking for the land of milk and honey. I don't think my dad really knew too much about the scripture, but he remembered something about that. Yeah, he was looking for the land of milk and honey, but he got over there and he just didn't find nothing but an empty belly. <laughs> God had a land of milk and honey for Old Testament Israel, and it was a land that was going to produce <laughs> fruitfulness for them. He's got a land of milk and honey for you yes. and me, too. It's a place in yes. Christ where grace flows. Oh, yeah. Grace flows oh, in yeah. Christ. Oh, what are you talking about in Christ? You put your faith in Jesus. He took you out of the world. He put you inside of Jesus. Yes. Now the eyes of God look upon you. He sees you as righteous, not because you do it all right, but because he did it all right. And when he looks at you and you keep your faith in Jesus, because you know that without that, you ain't going to make it. Now grace is for us like milk and honey, man. You're being nourished in the new land. You're being nourished by the hand of God. He's providing for you. And even though you're in the midst of a wilderness experience, he's got a promise for you that he's going to get you through to the other yes. side. Yes. Though you might be in a season, it might be a temporary moment in your life. If you will keep your eyes firmly focused on Jesus, I'm here to tell you, he's going to get you yes. through. Amen. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Listen, the Lord, real quick, I think I'm getting close to the end here for, for today. All right, you ready? The Lord allows us to be led into wilderness situations that stir and test us. Mm -hmm. Many times these circumstances lead to great chaos. The verse 2 again of Deuteronomy, verse 8, right? Chapter 8. Remember all the way which the Lord your God led you. It's not just the devil that's in control here. God is in control. And he knows how to do get some stuff accomplished in your life. Hallelujah. Next one is still in verse 2. Look at this. God uses these times of our lives to do what? To humble us. In frustrating circumstances that we can't control, we will either try to get out another way. That's a good word right there. Listen to that. We're either going to try to get out another way that is outside God's will, or we will turn to God and humble ourselves to his will. Verse 2. 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you. This is number 3 right here. He does it to correct our wrong. You also shall consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. You might not like it, but God is not scared to put a so-called whipping on his children. He will chasten his children. American Academy of Pediatrics can say they don't believe in corporal punishment all they want. The word of God says you spare the rod, you spoil the child. I'm not talking about beating nobody, so don't take my words out of context. I'm talking about properly instructing a child in the way that they should go. And when they don't listen, that they understand that there is, well, let me just say it like this, but don't cut me off in the middle. We've got to make sure we get the whole story, that there's pain involved. I don't, look, some kids don't respond that great to spanking, you know. Parents are, you know, I'm not even going to tell nobody to spank their kids no more because you don't know what somebody's going to do. they got some crazy people out there. Right. Now, all the preacher on Facebook Live told me to spank my kid. No, 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 no. It, it didn't, nobody ever told you to abuse your child. Nobody ever told you. No, that there's a proper way, and it's with love behind it and understanding that you're trying to effect the right result because you love your child. But some kids, some people are like, he won't respect, he won't respond to spanking. And I mean, I wear that boy out. He just looks at me like, hmm. Well, guess what? There's going to be something he'll feel. Amen. It's going to be something that's going to hurt him. Sometimes it's his video game. Right, right. 
I just ripped that thing out your life, boy. You're about to learn who the boss is in this situation. Your iPhone, your iPad, all your electronic devices. Ain't no McDonald's for the next two weeks. You shouldn't be eating that garbage anyway. And da 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 You about to learn you ain't going to get no blessing from your father when you walk in rebellion. Instead, you're going to learn to humble yourself just like I have to learn to humble myself or I'm not going to receive the blessings of God. That's good stuff right there because that's the word of the Lord. But we rather spoil them, right? Yeah. Just like we act like a bunch of little spoiled brats in the face of God. Huh? Yeah. Isn't it good when you hear the truth? Isn't it good when you hear the truth? I'm telling you to liberate you. I know it's called amen. Hallelujah. I know sometimes it comes like, man, I can't handle that preacher. Oh, well, you know what? The truth is the truth. Amen? Yes. Look at this. Number four, to follow his word and his ways. He put you in that wilderness experience for that too. Verse six. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Listen to me, child of God. You need to know this book. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do my best to study to show myself approved to be a workman that rightly divides the word of truth so that I will not be ashamed. I'm going to do my best by the grace of God to present the word of the Lord because I know what he says about his word. My word will not return unto me void. Instead, it will accomplish that which I intended for it to do. And I'm going to do my best to continue to study because I love this book and he did that in me because I didn't wake up one day and just decide I was going to love it. I love this book. I'm going to keep studying it. I'm going to keep preparing it. I'm going to give you the, the best that I know how to give you. But all that is not going to be enough. You are going to have to get into this book for yourself. You are going to have to get alone with the Lord for yourself. You're going to have to, even if it starts off as a whisper and says, God, I need you. Because that's all you've got the strength to do. If it just would start there. And if it just start with one passage of scripture. Because you've got to do some of the homework. Because you've got to familiarize yourself. Because here's the world. Out here, but in here. See, there's a completely different pathway that's contained between these two bookends right here. This is another pathway. Yeah. The world ain't going to believe it, but I'm here to tell you, this is the will of God. Amen. The character of God. The path of God. Amen. Amen. You know, we over here receiving our instruction from the world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, I keep going back because I don't listen to secular music, but that song, whenever I was teaching on secular music, trying to explain to people, why? Because I used to go to church. Man, you can't listen to worldly music and they never gave me a reason why. Now I understand. Because the world has a message. Yes. The world's music is preaching a message. And I keep going back to that one song. I don't know who's saying it. I think it was a country song. And she said, the name of the song was Compass. And they interviewed. Well, what is the meaning behind the song? Well, your heart is the compass. of Your, your heart is your compass. That means you just got to let your heart lead you and guide you on what feels right for you. Lies! Amen. Lies and garbage! Amen. The word of the Lord says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Even a man who loves God will be deceived by the enemy into believing that this feels right to him and he will begin to motion himself in a particular way. But the whole time, the word of the Lord, see the word of God says in Roman, uh, Proverbs chapter 8 that wisdom is in the streets crying out, hey! Won't you come and get some of this? And it's almost like I see wisdom is Jesus, by the way. And Jesus is out there. Hey, won't you come and get some of this? I'm offering life. I'm offering wisdom. Won't you come and partake? And everybody's just walking by. Yeah. Everybody's busy. They got their own plans. They got their own thing going on. Oh, but that's not what the people over here say that I work with. That's not what these people that I think look cool say. Everybody's got something else going on. No, but they're all living a lie. They've been bought into a lie. I'm here to tell you this is the truth. And if we, hallelujah, and if we don't know what it says, we're at a disadvantage. Yes. But if we would learn what it says, Amen. I'm telling you, yeah. there's wisdom. There's wisdom for us, child of God. Amen. Follow his word in his ways. Number five, he make you hungry for the things of God. Yeah. And he will nourish you during these times with spiritual food. Look at verse three, Deuteronomy 8. And suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna. Amen. He, he made you hungry. But he also fed you manna. And manna is spiritual food. Jesus said, Moses didn't give you that food, that bread from heaven. My father gave you the living bread that came down from heaven. When you get a hold of Jesus and you start feeding on that, you start getting life. You start getting the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Number six, ultimately his desire is to bring our lives to a good place. Verse seven, for the land your God brings you. He brings you into a good land. Amen. So what is the main thought that causes the conflict between David and God? 
What's the big deal here with David counting his soldiers? I mean, really, come on. We're about to close it up. You ready? I mean, what's the big deal? Shouldn't a, wouldn't a good king want to know how many fighting men he has? I mean, the word of the Lord says to pay good attention to your flocks, talking about your money, so that you would know what you have. You're going to be a good steward. Wouldn't a good king that's being a good steward know how many soldiers he has? Yeah, sure. That's not the issue. The issue is there's a bigger problem here. It's a motive of the heart. It's a concept in the mind, see? The problem, rather, is that he is moving the object of his faith away from God and putting it on his army. He's putting his hope and his trust in something else other than God. He's trusting in numbers instead of God. How do we do this in our lives? See, it's right here that we must ask ourselves, what is it in my life that I put my trust in that is taking the place of God? That's for you to figure out. That's between you and Jesus. Amen? I'll leave some of that to y'all. The genesis or the starting point for this for David is obviously fear. Now, once again, I said it earlier, we're talking about a warrior king. We're talking about approximately 17 years old standing up to Goliath, this great Nephilim giant. Do some studying on that to figure out what that word means. This, this great Nephilim giant that's really, he's half, half fallen angel, half human being. Do what you want with that. That's what the word of God teaches. Something very spiritual, something very terrorizing, something very, it will strike fear in your heart. And the whole camp is cowering, yet young David, what does he do? He walks up and he's like, um, this isn't right. People of God aren't supposed to be, aren't given the spirit of fear, but of love, power, love, and of a sound mind. People of God aren't supposed to live under the bondage of their enemy. They have a great warrior. His name is Jesus. He went before yes. them. He yes. is the rock. Amen. As a matter of fact, give me a rock. Let me find a good rock right here yeah. to take this giant down. Amen. Yeah. Jesus wants to be a rock in your life. There might be a giant speaking in your life, but I'm here to tell you that the Lord will knock him down for you. Amen. Yes. David knew that wasn't right. So he's fought giants. He's fought lions. He's fought bears. But here he is, and he's reaching out. He's living in fear right now in this moment. Let me tell you, every child of God will face mountaintops and valleys. Yeah. Listen, you. a lot of times we, we just see the, the big moments. Man, look at David. He's like a shooting star. He's rising to the top. We miss these spots in his life. Yeah. Right, right. The spots of failure, the spots of frustration, right? Yes. The, the places of depression, mm -hmm. the places yeah. where the enemy is trying to get the best of him. Listen to me, yes. child of God. It's not always tiptoe through the tulips for the yeah, Christian. That's right. That's right. No, there's, there's hard times for the Christian right. sometimes. But it's the same God that's going to get us through, amen? Yeah. amen. He's a king of a nation with enemies, and he sees those enemies. He feels weak instead of reminding himself of those great victories. And he chooses to look at his immediate circumstance, and he views it right now as greater and bigger than his God. Is your situation seemingly bigger than your God right now? Because if it is, I'm telling you right now, that's not the word of the Lord. From, here, from there, he looks at something else, confidence in the size of his army, rather than confidence in the size of his God. And this results in a failure of the test that was provided and opens a door spiritually that allows chaos and confusion to flood into he and Israel's life. So again, let's ask ourselves, what is it in our lives that we turn our trust towards instead of God when we face obstacles that try to strike fear into our hearts? Or maybe it's not even fear. What are we turning towards that we want to fix it that's not the answer from God? See, here's just a couple of specific situations, but if don't let yourself get blocked just because I only mentioned four things, because this can go for everything in your life. Amen. For the person that has more bills than money, what may they turn their confidence towards? Mm -hmm. It's possible that a woman would look towards a man. A person may look towards another job, which in itself wouldn't have necessarily been bad, but the new job maybe kept them further from the word and wisdom of God, so it prevented them even more from receiving the knowledge that they really needed from God. It just might be a situation where I'm paralyzed by fear and anxiety over my situation. I turn to some other kind of medicine or, or, some, or, or instead of Jesus, a counselor, you know, a pill, a beer, anything other than Jesus. And when I do that, I'm looking to something else. I'm not looking to God. I know that sometimes the other thing we can see, it's right there, right? And listen to me. The church is deceived with this kind of thing. You got people that are filled with churches that still struggle with addictions. The reason that they're struggling with addiction is twofold. Number one, the preacher's not finding out how you really get victory and promoting it to the church. How do you really get victory? It's a done deal. Jesus already did it. 
Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 says that he destroyed the power of demon spirits and fallen angels yes. through the cross because he, he stole away their power over us through sin. He dealt with sin. Yes. Now it's our time to trust that God wants to deliver us from it and to hold on to it. And when we do that, grace flows and strengthens. It's twofold either. Number one, you just didn't know. That's what it says in Romans 6. Did you not know? Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to stay ignorant. Lord, Lord. The word of the Lord, you can be awakened to what the word of the Lord really says. But, but that's just the first problem. The second problem is surrender. Yes. I was talking to somebody the other day. It was a good word. And sometimes I got to be reminded of stuff. Yeah. Brother said, we hear it. We got to exercise it. Yes. The problem that the child of God has many times is, is that even though he knows the will and the word of God, he is not ready to walk in the will and the word of God. Why? Because his stubborn, rebellious heart, like Israel, keeps saying, no, I want to keep on going. Lord, change our hearts, please. Yes. Right now in your heart, just say that right now. Lord, change my heart, please. Please, even in spite of myself. Even if there's one hand trying to hold on to sin, Lord, let the other hand grab a hold of you. And please, Lord, change my heart, please. Amen. And if you'll do that, if you'll meet it in your heart, I'm telling you, he'll start to do a work. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to look a little closer at the story next week. But King David went it's outside of God's will. And now there's chaos. Naya, could you come to the keyboard or whoever's going to help us out this morning? We're going to look a little closer at the story next week, but King David went outside of God's will, and now there's chaos, and there are only three choices. None of the choices seem good for anyone in Israel, but there's only one that puts him in the hands of God. This choice results in death and heartache because people die, and certainly he feels responsible for all of this, but he chooses to put his trust in God as he goes through all of this. What are you going through, and will you choose to trust God or something else to get you through.